Welcome to the Influence Factory podcast. This program is dedicated to support professionals who have a desire to develop their digital business influence so they can navigate through a fast-paced, constantly growing digital world. We invite newcomers as well as our family of business influencers to a place to play, share ideas, questions, tips, and guidance with other thought leaders around the globe. Sit back and enjoy our program with your host, Dean Delisle, as he interviews guests. News and commentary are provided by Jackson Delisle and Monica Hacker. Power Move lessons are provided by the Influencer Marketing Department at Social Jack. And production, editing, and distribution is provided by the Social Jack production team. All right, today's show is brought to you by Planable. Planable Planable.io gives your social media team everything they need to really move their creative process forward. It allows you to preview social media posts as they are live, real time. No more screenshots, mock-ups, spreadsheets, ah, spreadsheets. Your (laughs) clients can review content from within the platform. And do you have anything to say about it, Monica? It's a great platform. We've been using it now for a month. I love it. Um, It's a game changer in the content world. I highly suggest it. Yeah, go to Planable, P-L-A-N-A-B-L-E dot I-O to start your free trial today. All right. Today's guest is an amazing, it is the, my personal king of content. That's how I'm going to introduce him. Uh, uh, our influencer guest is Shane Barker. He was one of the pioneers of influencer marketing and digital marketing co- consultant who specializes in influencer marketing, product launches, sales funnels, targeted traffic, website conversions, and all around. He's consulted with Fortune 500 companies, and he is a regular contributor uh, for uh, Inc., Huffington Post, Forbes, Salesforce. Shane, come on down. It's great to have you on the program. Today. What's going on, guys? Man, I'm excited about being on here. This is kind of fun to listen to you guys ahead of time. Well, I'm kind of like all pumped up. You got me looking up at plantable.io and all kinds of fun stuff. I'm learning all kinds of things. <laughs> Something else to put on one of your lists, right? <laughs> That's it. I know, God, that li- the lists that never go away. I know. So um, I can't even remember where you and I first met. I think you and I bumped into each other at MDMC. And then I know for, for sure we were back to back at IMCX, which we both had packed rooms for that. So that was exciting. And, uh, and then I, I'm sure we had been at other things before, but it was, it was actually cool to finally, I sat in on one of your sessions and I'd been following your content for a while. So it's always fun when you exchange on social media and then you meet people in real life. I just think that's really the magic moments. Yeah, it really is, man. It, it is because there's certain, you know, there's certain content. Oh, am I muted? I shouldn't be. Let's see. I'm showing good on my side. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Oh, you can. Okay. That so Dean, me. can you hear me? Yeah, oh, no, gotcha. Can. That was all, all yeah. me. Oh yeah, no worries. So, I mean, yeah, for me, it's, it is nice. It is nice when you have, you know, when you, there's certain people you follow and then you can meet with them in the real world. And usually it's at conferences, right? Conferences or expos or something like that. And it's awesome. That's why I really enjoy the speaking side of things. Cause then you can kind of collaborate. I, I always forget, like, I don't know, you, you know, you have certain you know, amount of exposure of those people come to your website and read your content. But I think we always kind of forget until you go to an event and people come up to you and say something about your content, which is nice because it's, you know, obviously you want to put out great content that people find a lot of value from. And then to be able to meet people in person and they say, hey, I've, you know, followed your blog for six months or a year and I really enjoy your content is very rewarding, you know, because it's, you get in these little silos of creating content and you don't always get to hear of people, you know, because most people just view the content, right? You don't, not everybody writes a comment, so you don't know how many people are actually taking and look at it. So that's, I'm a huge fan of the events and being able to do workshops and stuff. So it's fun to be able to take it offline and, and you know, be able to meet those individuals. Yeah. And I meant to ask you before, are those air plants behind you? They are. They are because, the, so what happened was, is we used to have real plants and then they all died uh, over and over and over. And I'm so I felt like, too. <laughs> man, I, I, my wife is like, all you have to do is spray them with water. And I, I, for some reason, couldn't get it going and couldn't get it done. So now she's like, I'm just going to give you plants that are either a fake or that don't need water. They can, you can water them like once every 47 years or something like that. So give right. or take a few years. So yeah, that's, that's exactly it. Yeah. Yeah. And it was funny because uh, I saw that you owned a bar in uh, Chino, California, and I grew up in hospitality, working the bar and like a bar back and things like that, and then bartending. And then I was a bouncer for a few years. Um, But it was, um, you know, uh, so how was that? I mean, did you just decide, wake up one day and go, hey, I got a couple buddies that want to open a bar or what was that all about? No, it's it's crazy. So this is like, 
the Shane you're talking with today is like Shane, probably 3.0. This was Shane 1.0, right? And so what I used to do, like when I was 16, I started working at, it's called Chevy's Mexican Restaurant, which I think there's only like two left in yeah, the nation now. They're, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, and the funny part about it was I started off as a buster and I think I started there when I was 15, which now that I think about it, it's probably illegal. But anyways, I think I said it was 16. I wanted to work. I wanted to make money. So right. I was doing that and I just went up from buster to, to waiter to bartending. And then I ended up doing corporate work. So I was actually at the corporate office and they would fly me around to open restaurants. So I was in the hospitality mm-hmm. industry for a long time. Um, I ended up going over to Chico, California, which is where Sierra Nevada is from. And I was there. I opened up the restaurant there. I decided I was going to finish up school there. And there was somebody that literally was across the street from me. It says, Hey, I'm opening this bar. Um, we've had like six grand openings, but we didn't open. You know, he's like, I really am trying to figure out that like how to really get this thing going. And so I said, well, I open restaurants and you know, I'd be willing to partner with you do some little bit of money and a little sweat equity. And so that's how I jumped in the bar industry. So we did that. And it was, I mean, once again, at Chico, California is a Chico was, it was like one of the number one party schools. This was, I think, in the <laughs> '90s by Playboy magazine or something. Said, yeah, so it's right. like it's like infamous. They used to have Pioneer Days and stuff, and they've tried to. And I'm going to say clean it up. Like, oh, there's not as many parties, but Chico is like I said, it's where Sierra Nevada's came from. So, I mean, that's, you know, 35 years in the, in the craft beer industry. So it's been interesting, but yeah, the bar scene was, was fun, man. It was, I was single and, you know, it was fun owning a bar and there was, you know, there's upsides and downsides to owning a bar. Um, Chica was interesting because we opened on, we literally opened on graduation weekend. So it was like the oh craziest weekend open. We got the permits, everything was done. We opened up. Did, I mean, did it was you cover crazy all the mirrors mess. and the windows. <laughs> yeah. So they didn't get broken. Yeah. I think I stayed up all night and just was telling me, Hey, don't you break my window. You know, I just yeah, right. make sure that nothing happened, but yeah, no, it was like phenomenal weekend. But what I didn't realize is then you go into summertime and all the students leave. And right. so we had like a phenomenal, crazy week and guys is great. I'm counting this money. I'm like, man, this is a plug. I'm the best industry in the world. I mean, you know, it's, it's recession proof. This is, it doesn't get any better than this. And then all of a sudden Monday, I'm like, like, where is everybody? And everybody left, right? And so I'm like, now it's summertime. There's, you're trying to get in the locals and everybody has some kind of a Sierra Nevada dollar pint special. And I can't really do a 75 cent beer because I'd be like yeah, breaking right. even. So anyways, it was, a, it was a huge lesson in like, wow, I need to learn how to do some marketing because I've got to somehow pull in the locals because the students are easy, right? It's like, I used to say it's like selling crack to a crackhead, which I've never done that, but it's just pretty easy <laughs> from what I just, the, the, you know, I make the assumption that they are always coming back for more and with alcohol and Chico and, you know, people want to go have a fun time then they would come to your bar because it's all, it's a, not a huge town. Um, but in the summer, it was a little bit of a different challenge. Yeah, right. And I have a couple of buddies that own bars here in Wrigleyville and that's uh, Wrigleyville. If you've ever been there has like, tons of bars and the whole deal is that um when it's not baseball season it's pretty sparse you know so they have to make all their money to your point you know they and they have like you know 75 100 bars around them they have to make all their money in that short period of time around that area and college campuses feel like the same thing too it's like it is it's it's you, you catch them during the hot season and they leave for three months. I mean, then it's sparse and then you got to figure out like, and I didn't have, you know, I didn't have nine months to save money to get to that point. We'd spend all of our money on opening the bar and say, this is awesome. Great opening weekend. And then after that, it's like, now what do we do? Cause the students are gone. So, I mean, in, in Chico, California, literally it's, the biggest employers are Inlo, which is the local hospital in Chico state, which is the, the university. And that's it. So there's wow. not, it's not, it's a small town. And so it was a big reality check, you know, on Monday and Tuesday, I'm like, God, there was nobody coming in. Like, what do we need to do? And so we'd have to, you know, we did flyers and there was a lot of different things that we did. And how do you differentiate yourself? Which is, you know, that's, and it's no different than today, right? You're talking about your, the bars that are in Wrigleyville, right? So, I mean, you're talking about 75 bars that are around you. Like, how do you differentiate yourself? Right. And yeah. sometimes it's price. Sometimes it's, you know, who you have there, it's marketing. There's a lot of different things, but it becomes very, you know, it's a, it's a crowded space. And how do you stand out? That's really in any business. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And that's what I was, that's what I was playing in my head in Sierra Nevada. God bless them. They were the first canned IPA out there, I mm. believe. So, you know, we love those. <laughs> Good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You can't go wrong. Sierra Nevada has been around for a little while for sure. Yeah, for sure. So how do you go from like owning a bar hospitality? And it was funny. I started as a busser too. So how do you go from that to like all of a sudden being at the pioneer of this influencer marketing world? Give us a little, fill in the gaps for us a little bit. 
Yeah. Yeah. I think everybody should, should sit down here. It's going to be a long story. <laughs> I've got uncle Shane. That's going to tell you guys a little uncle story Shane. about how we got started. Yeah. <laughs> scary. Um, yeah. I mean, it really from, you know, opening restaurants and doing that kind of thing. I, the Chevy's wanted me to do full-time corporate work. I didn't really want to jump into that. I really was traveling and kind of having fun. And I, ended up going back and finishing school. So I went and had my marketing degree, but I've always had my own business. And so even when I was graduated from college, I had my own business. It was a, a company called Hot Pad. It was a reusable heat pack that I had uh, patents on. And so I would, you know, I, and I built it out as a therapeutic line. I also did a promotional line. So we did some stuff with Disney. And then I actually had uh, kiosks in the mall. So I was real, real heavy in that. So that's really how I kind of jumped into the marketing. My degree was in marketing. Man, that feels uh, more like direct sales, not marketing. I mean, Those it, kiosk is tough, man. You got to, you got to grab those people as they're going by. And it is not cheap. So the way that the, the kiosks work, which is crazy. So this here in Sacramento, like I asked people, Hey, what do you think we paid for the kiosk? And they're like, Oh, you know, maybe a thousand dollars a month at that time for one of the malls, I was paying $8,000 a month. Oh, and it, and we had to do it for three months because it was December is the big month, right? De well, the end of November, Black Friday, that kind of stuff. And then December. So we would start in October, really make no money because there was nobody really cared about you. And then at the end of November, you would make some of your money back. And then December was when you would have to, to cash in. You couldn't just go do a kiosk for one month. So, I mean, I had three kiosks. Um, and so, you know, wow. I'm talking about my overhead was pretty crazy. And so we had, you know, I had an investor at that point that, that it came in with a project, but you know, it's pretty crazy. And then you get this reality check of like, it's kind of crazy. The amount of people that can get sick on new year's Eve. Um, and so I have three kiosks that magically <laughs> three of my employees got sick oh the new year's Eve, which I mean, who knows? I mean, it's so probably crazy. Not the even in proximity, out. right? They're probably like, no, right no, they weren't. They were two hours away. So literally I, I, I was only two of the three, but I had two people calling, Oh, I'm not feeling good. Well, I, you know, I know what's going on there. And so I literally had to be in two places at once. So anyways, it's, it's that little stuff that's, you know, that when it comes to having an actual physical business and the marketing side of things was really all me. Um, yeah. when I was doing some stuff with like, you know, freelancer.com and really kind of, or actually at that time it was get a freelancer.com back in the day. Um, and just figuring out, Hey, what we need to do in regards to, you know, what's getting like getting the product out there. And, and I was working on everything. I mean, I had somebody helping me with a logo and helped me with a website, but I was, literally cutting my teeth with my own products. And so we were working on that phenomenal experience, you know, moving forward. And that's how I really learned how to do SEO. I was doing SEO before it was called SEO, learning from people that were doing SEO when it wasn't SEO, they just were trying to get rank, better rankings on Google. And we just went through the whole cycle. I mean, I did social media marketing and I went through, you know, the, the driving traffic through whatever it is, different sources. And then influencer marketing kind of fell in my lap probably about seven years ago now, maybe a little more than that. Um, and really jumped in my lap in the sense that I had a client that came to me and says, Hey, you know, I'm looking for um, somebody to help me with my social media marketing. And, and so she was a fitness, um, she was in the fitness space. And I honestly, when she reached out to me, I was like, ah, I don't want anything to do with the fitness space. It's, you know, it's just oversaturated. There's just too many people in it. Right. And then I did a call and she literally told me she was doing $400,000 a year in sales off of Instagram. And that like blew me away. Like, I'm like, you gotta be, I thought she was lying to me at first. And then I thought she was part of like a Russian credit card fraud ring or something. <laughs> I don't know. Like I just, I, for me, my spider sense was going crazy. I'm like, right. there's no way that she's making, you know, $30,000 a month off this. And after I did a little research and looking into some stuff and she was website, wasn't that good or logo wasn't that good or or eBooks were very simple. Like this is how to do a push up. This is how to do a lunge. And I got, I thought, God, this just doesn't make sense to me. There was huge room for improvement. So that's why, you know, we ended up taking on the project, but that was influencer marketing. We, what she would do, she was an influencer herself. She would put out these products and people would buy them. And then what we started doing is talking to other fitness influencers, lifestyle influencers and saying, Hey, would you like to promote this product? Or how would you like to do no, her name is Zoe Rodriguez. How would you like to do a program for six months for free? We'll even pay you to do the program. I mean, there was a number of, there's hundreds of different ways that we work with influencers in different platforms. And so I was I mean, we got her, you know, I, Dean, you know this story. We got her to 1.6 million right. in one year. So this girl, she was 23 years old, clearing a million dollars off of Instagram. Literally, we did SEO. We did content, create all kinds of stuff for her. 1% of her sales, if that. Everything was done through Instagram. She built this story of, of the story of no booty, because I mean, what I mean is booty, like not having a butt, to big old booty. So it was like this. She was a runner, didn't, you know, have a booty. And then she was doing her lunges and squats and all the fun stuff. And I, I always call it her inner J-Lo. So all of a sudden, one day, her butt, 
didn't really just pop out, but it was like, and the girls going, Oh my God, that's me today. This is what I want to look like Z- the, the Zoe today. Like, right. what do we need to do? And it's take the program. So that was, that was influencer marketing. And we were, she was, it was interesting because she was a product and a brand. So we right. also got pitched from, from, from products and I was in the middle of everything. So I helped her you know, put together a customer service team and redo the website, redo all of her logo, her logo, redo her website, got her a brand new domain name that, cause the other one was really long. And so we just, we really just kind of polished up the business that she had and was able to, I mean, quadruple it. So it was interesting. It was interesting times and it was phenomenal, phenomenal success. And like I said, I mean, you're 23 years old, clearing a million dollars, like life's pretty good. If you know, when you look at that, not too bad. I don't know if when we were in LA, if you met, um, uh, any of the people that I had there from Holonis and some of the other influencer platforms. And I know now there's over what 70 that we're tracking out of 450. You know, there's so many platforms out there. Uh, yeah. But, but uh, I was at one of their shareholder meetings and I met, um, I think it was Taylor Kniff and, you know, some of these other guys. And I think they're like, you know, like you said, they're 2019, 20, 21, and they're making, you know, they're making 200 grand a month and they have, uh, they literally have $700,000 in their PayPal account. <laughs> it's like, I didn't even think you could put that much in a PayPal account, but I'm like, well, what? <laughs> Is it I insured? Would, yeah. <laughs> I don't I know. Would, <laughs> I will tell you something right now. If, if anybody that's listening to this has, any big amount of money into PayPal, take that out. And the reason why I'm saying that is because PayPal at any time, and this happened with some of my influencers, at any time they can suspend you for any reason and keep that money or hold on to that money. And I'm not saying anything against PayPal, but I, I've literally seen it with my own eyes. If you have a large, we, I never keep a large amount of money into PayPal. I know you were just because that's important because if you have that much money and then it gets frozen, then you're, you got to try to get that back. I'm not saying PayPal's stealing money by any means. I'm just saying you, you know, I would, I would get that into someplace a little closer to home. Yeah. They are in control. <laughs> they are. They are. <laughs> well, it's, and it's driving my business guys crazy. Cause I deal, we deal with business influencers a lot where we go into brands and humanize the brand with the people and more on the business influencer side. And I'm always drawn these parallels between, you know, that's why we still dabble a small percentage in what you do a big part in what you're working with these big influencers, but really the game is the same, isn't it? I mean, you're working on your personal brand, your story, you want to be known, you want to get found and you want to monetize, right? I mean, really the formula. It really is. It's the same formula, whether you're plugging it into being an influencer or a brand or whatever that is, right? Or a business influencer, it's the same deal, right? Really comes down to is like, how do you you know, how do you, because making your brand or making your, your voice human is, is important, right? And that becomes right. difficult. And, and a lot, most, most brands fail at doing that, right? Um, and don't know how to do that. And so I think that's an important factor of going and educating them and saying, hey, listen, like, you know, nobody wants to talk to a brand. They want to know that there's a human behind it and yeah. somebody has a heart and understands what you, what's going on. And at least you're listening to what, you know, to what they, they have to say. And so I think that's, that is hard for brands. It's hard for them to make that transition into, like, because everybody's doing it the same way for the most part, which is not right, not, not the correct way. No, and, and how do you stand out? And, and really, the people make the difference in all of that, you know, which is which is interesting how many people still don't get that or they're just still playing safe. It's like, well, we'll just spend more on ads and put our brand more out there. And I'm like, okay, you're sort of missing it, but you can do that. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I mean, I think because the thing is, it's, it's something new, right? And it's like, well, how do I, I mean, this is the way everybody's doing it. So we're just doing it the way they do it. And it's also an easier way of doing it, right? But it's not the right way, right? So it's, we have to figure out like, what are you looking at? Are you looking to make a change where people go, wow, that's really awesome. That XYZ company that when I write something on Twitter, they write something back or that when I send them an email that I know they're going to respond within 24 hours, or I call their line and then somebody answers within 30 seconds. Like those are things that that people appreciate, you know, and I think there's some brands that have done a phenomenal job of once again, recognizing that, you know, it's, it's harder, right. It takes more bandwidth and it, you know, there's a lot of things that happen in, in regards to that. Um, but it, you just got to kind of figure it out. I mean, it's, you know, everybody wants to be heard and you have to figure out, are you going to be there when they, when they call or you're not going to be there? Yeah, that's, uh, that's awesome. And then um, what are some of the biggest um, things that you run into? And I'm going to say, you know, maybe even resistance wise when you're helping people, because uh, we run into this all the time in personal branding, we interview them, we want them to tell their story. And then, you know, then, you know, they want to, it's almost like they want to keep the best parts out. <laughs> Do you ever run into that? 
Yeah, you mean like in regards to what their story is? Yeah, like they're, you know, it, the part that really makes them unique and authentic, they're like, oh, I don't want people to know about that. I'm like, well, wait a minute. That's like the coolest yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the thing is, it just depends on the individual. Like some people want to be more humble, right? Yeah. I mean, I get that. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's like you you have to differentiate yourself, right? You're, if you're yeah. one of those 75 bars that's within a one mile radius, like what is going to differentiate you? If you do the same stuff as the other 75 bars, then you're going to be one of the 75 bars, right. right? Or do you talk about your story about like, hey, we've had four generations in this bar. We've had, you know, Mickey Mantle came here in 72 and had a drink and Trump's been here. Like whatever it is, right? Whatever yeah. you go into and you talk about that story of the reason why you're the best bar and the coolest bar, then you don't have to go and, you know, sell $2 pints because everybody else is doing $2.50 pints, right? right? What you're doing is you're, you're selling the experience. You're selling like, hey, when you come here, there's history. There's something, there's something deeper than just what every, all the other bars have, which is a cheap, you know, drink special. Like really, when you come here, you're a part of history. You're a part of this deeper, you know, this deeper connection in the Chicago community, which is important. And people want to know that, right? I want to know like, Hey, I didn't know that. I mean, stories are so important. People don't realize that, you know, especially in in alcohol, it's like, you know, when you're drinking a wine, I mean, how many times you drinking a wine and you have a, you know, a distributor or something talk about, you know, uncle Lulu that came over on a boat and he had, you know, four cents in his pocket and one wood dime and had a, a, you know, a seed that came from Italy and he dropped it in the thing. And that's how they, you know, built this thing up <laughs> right. to a $10 million business. People were like, Oh my God, this wine is so good that uncle Lulu came over on his boat. And it's a story, right? Does it taste that much better? No. But in your mind, you're like, oh, that's awesome. There's the story behind that. And then you go, what do you do? You go tell everybody, oh, let me tell you about this wine. And, you know, it's like people love that. They want to know the history. They want to know, like, you know, now it's like farm to table and this kind of stuff. I want to know where it was made and this. But people want that kind of story. Same thing with coffee. It's like, who are the farmers and who are this? Some people really enjoy that because they want to say, oh, I'm, you know, socially responsible because I know Pedro who, you know, Phil did this and this and made this coffee. That's awesome. But people love that. They want to know, you know, want to know the story behind it. Yeah, that's funny. At MDMC, I ran into somebody that I knew and I'm like, oh, where are you working now? She goes, I work for a, a railroad company. And I go, oh, you guys are in transportation. She goes, no, we literally make the railroad and keep it running. I go, wow, that's got to be an interesting business. She goes, it is, it is a small fan base, but it's a loyal, dedicated fan base. Anybody that loves railroad is plugged in. And I go, really? I said, have you guys dabbled in influencer marketing? She goes, yeah, we have like Ray who does the welding on the tracks and he's become quite popular because he keeps the trains running, you know, and he's got a great story. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's it, right? I mean, otherwise people would have been like, who cares? And then all of a sudden you got here, Ray's story of, you know, he's been doing this since he was 25. He's third generation railroad builders, like whatever that is. And people go, oh, that's awesome. Like, Everybody loves a story, you know, it's like everybody wants to know what, what's the backdrop? Like what, how did this thing all start? I mean, I know companies that, that I, mean, I can't say their names because it's, they're, they're not real stories, but people that have like built up a story because it's helped them with, you know, with, with what it is. They're like, we don't really have a great story. And I'm like, well, let's talk this out. You know, cause some people once again are humble or don't, oh, I don't really know. And I don't really want to brag about things that have happened or this or talk about that. But really like people do want to hear about that. You just have to figure out what you're comfortable with sharing. And is it, you know, is it going to be something people want to hear? Yeah, that's awesome. Um, let's let's move to content because uh, you know I introduced you as the content king because I, uh, I you know I I go I'm probably on your website once a week and I just love reading it and I actually saw something today that I think is worth mentioning and I believe I know what you're doing but it might be worth you giving us a few tips on this but I read a couple blogs and it says uh, updated September 2019 and I go did you take an older piece of content and then you authentic, authentically updated it for now and it's now republished? So I'm going to give you guys, this is like, this Secret is sauce. my, this is it. I mean, literally this is it. I'm telling you right now, if you, Monica, and I, Monica, you and the team, listen to this, right? Write this down. This is like, this is, this is the, this is the moment we've been waiting for. This is what the quiz will be about later for your whole staff. So this is, right. this is probably your number one thing. So what we've done, which is everybody needs to do this. If this is, and it's, it shouldn't be too difficult. If you're writing content for your blog and let's say you get, let's say there's a certain keyword, let's say it's, um, you know, whatever influencer marketing. Yeah. Or maybe it's a little longer, te- longer keyword. Let me say influencer marketing platform. Let's say what you need to do is you need to go there is when you create some content and let's say you're on page two or three or four, whatever that is, what you want to do is every 
two months, three months, you want to repurpose that content. So you write content, you add four or 500 words to it. You add a video to it. Um, you add a new graphic to it, add an infographic to it. Um, and then you share that infographic with other people and get them to backlink to it. But the goal of this is Google loves the repurposing of content, loves it. Like I'm telling you right now, 70% of my articles that I write are on the first page for the keywords that we go after. I mean, that's how silly it is. And my team repurposes and we'll, you know, once again, if there are blog articles, 1500 words, then we'll take it up to 2000 words. A high percentage of the time, it'll take me from page two or three onto page one. Wow. Um, it's just, it's phenomenal. So the and it, rewriting... And it, doesn't, and it doesn't see it as repetitive content, right? So... No, because okay. we've rewritten it. So what we've done is we'll add more to it. So Google loves updates, right? Nobody... No, when you go to look at something on Google and I go, hey, these are the 10 best influencer marketing platforms, and it was written in 2014... Google doesn't want to show that, right? Because guess what happened? We have five years of updates. Like, yeah, hey, right. Shane, that's awesome content. But really, I'm looking for something that's more relevant. So what happens is, is when I update it, hey, the 15 best social media platforms in 2019, guess what happened? Google goes, wow, 2019, this person's looking for influencer marketing platforms. This is the article that we want to do. So then all of a sudden, you'll see. And so I'll put on there, this is when our update was. And so Google will know. Right. So if I have, you know, influencer marketing platforms in 2012, Google's like, mm, you're a little behind there, soldier, a little behind well, and, about and seven years. Funny is when we, when we search, I don't know if I, I can't be the only one doing this, but I literally, I'll legitimately go and look at the search and I'll go, Oh wait, I want 2019. And I add that to my keyword search. And then I get, you know, like you said, the, that's it. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the thing is like, you really want to, you updating your content. So I just saw, I was in, um, I was in Toronto, I think two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago now. Um, and Neil Patel, that was his big thing. So it was funny. I was, he, he was talking about some stuff and he goes, yeah, the easiest thing to do is repurpose your content. And I thought, oh, Neil's going to give everybody the secret sauce today. I like it. So, I mean, that's, that's it. Literally, if there's a thousand other things you can do talking about like, you know, doing your content in a different language to get international. I mean, there's a lot of things, you, but that's a lot of work. And then you have to have bandwidth and capital and stuff like that. But really the repurposing of content, go look at where you're at today, assuming that you're, you're writing content with intent of some kind of a keyword you're going after, see where you're at today, add some more stuff to that content. Once again, we do levels of it. So we'll add some, you know, written content. If that doesn't do better then Hey, we'll maybe add a video. I'll do a video. Maybe it's an infographic, whatever this is, but you want to, you know, obviously rewrite that content or, you know, add something, another piece of type of content to it. And then, you know, you want to go after backlinks as well to be able to get up in the rankings. Yeah. I love it. I love it. And then, um, <clears throat> I noticed like, uh, like we do, you publish, uh, articles in LinkedIn. Is that, is that content that you also have on your website? I didn't go and match them up, but is that pretty much yeah. repurposing? Yeah. So I, what I we noticed, do is I, yeah. Cause I noticed, uh, Google doesn't really punish you for that you know, replication. Yeah, we do a number of different things. So it's any like the distribution of content. So it's LinkedIn, uh, Medium, we've had some great successes. I've driven a lot of traffic through Medium. Um, Quora, we've had a good amount. We have a distribution plan that we do either for clients and also for myself, um, where we go and we, you know, we'll get a piece of content and then we'll repurpose that content for, you know, social media. So usually, you know, sometimes we're making them into little videos. Sometimes we're doing it for Instagram. Sometimes we're just, we're always trying new and different things. We're asking, you know, finding where people ask certain questions on Quora, then obviously we'll share part of the article. Medium will put most of the article up there and we'll say, hey, to read the rest of the article, go to shanebarker.com and they can click on it. Medium is also, I mean, you can also now be on their partner program, um, which we're making a few hundred bucks a month on their partner program. We're writing the exact same content um, and you know, we put it up there. Um, I mean, like, you know, some of the stuff like how to be an influencer and how to monetize Instagram, we're number one for those because we're able to drive a good amount of traffic, actually a phenomenal amount of traffic through different avenues. And that's the distribution of, of content. Like this one thing I think people miss out on is they spend all kinds of time on writing great content and that's phenomenal, but then you got to get it out there, yeah. right? Unless you have a phenomenal following that's automatically going to share it for you. So, you know, spend a good amount of time on great content, which is the key, right? That's you'll always index well with Google. If you're putting out great content over, you know, a consistent amount of time, but it's really the distribution. Right. You want to get people coming there. You want people getting signed up for your newsletter and then constantly getting used to getting emails from you. And when you get updates, build out the email list. There's a lot of fun stuff that happens there. So then in doing that with uh, Medium and some of these other platforms, uh, are, you, are, you, are you switching it up a tiny bit so it feels like different content to Google or are you just really pasting the same content in there? No, no, we, we, uh, Google and I are friends. So we've had a good talk and we've had a little handshake agreement that we just, we write the exact same content. I mean, cause it's really, we haven't ever been penalized for that. 
Um, another thing that we do on Medium, which is really interesting, is we, you, know, you can write that same piece of content and submit it to different groups on Medium. So you can have a, like, Hacker Noon is one of them, right? And there's a lot of them. There's hundreds of them. And so you have, you know, ones that will have, you know, 50,000 followers. And you'll say, hey, I want to submit this content. They go, that's epic content. Hey, we're going to approve it on here. They approve it. And now you have their audience that's seen your content that will drive traffic as well. So there's a lot of different ways to drive traffic. You just got to figure out, you know, what kind of traffic you want to drive. And, you know, some of it is the, the sheer numbers of traffic, but it's also the right amount of traffic as well. So that's why you want to post your content in places that you think are going to be relevant to your audience and where your audience will come and what's going to come to your website, sign up for the newsletter. You got to figure out how you're going to pull those people in to continuously bring them to your site. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and then are you, um, it looks like in uh, some of your blogs, like with ours, you're uh, embedding video in there. So do you, sh do you shoot specific video or do you pull uh, video from previous content or both related to that blog? You know, it really is just, it's all depends on time, right? How much time yeah. we've got in regards to that. And we're testing a few different things always, yeah. right? To see what happens. I mean, this is the thing is putting, you're never going to, it's never going to be a bad thing for you to put a video on YouTube because there's, we have Google as a main search engine and literally the second search engine is YouTube, right? And yeah. so people go there to learn how to do stuff. And so what happens is, is, I mean, you're almost never going to see somebody that goes and looks something up on Google and then uh, it's Vimeo or Vimeo, or however you say it is going to be number one for a video. Like you'll just never see that. If Google says, oh, we don't give special treatment to, to YouTube. Okay. Well, you do the research because I've never seen one of those videos be number one other than if it's on YouTube. Right. So when you write, you know, write some content, what we've done in the past is, and there's a number of different ways to do this, but you have uh, 10, you know, whatever it is, 10 ways to do better SEO, whatever that, that right. is. Then we do an article where I'm either A, reading it. Hey, you guys wanted to give you guys an overview of this article. Here goes, yeah. you know, it's a two minute video. We put it on YouTube. Obviously, you want to make sure we have the key, the uh, keywords in there. You want to change out the URLs of, of the actual, the title of the videos, um, of the actual file. I mean, there's all right. kinds of different stuff, right? You want to make sure in the description, you have some keywords in there as well. And then what happens is Google says, hey, this is awesome. They've got a great video that's on, that's on, YouTube, which is a backlink, right? You're going to put that on your, on your actual site. And then Google goes, wow, this must be some great content because we've seen they're popular on, on YouTube. We see them on their blog and then your rankings can go higher. So we're always testing different stuff um, with regards to that, right? And we've seen infographics have done great because if it's a great article and people see it, we put a little code down at the bottom that people can take that infographic and put it on their website for free. Um, a lot of the times we'll offer to write some content for them. Hey, we'll give you 400, you know, 400 words of original content and here goes the link to, to the article that we wrote. And this is great infographic you can put on your website. And as long as it's not salesy or pitching anything, it's general information that their audience would enjoy. It's easy to get backlinks that way. Um, we got a, all kinds of fun ways to, you know, like I said, to get to drive traffic or drive, you know, uh, like, you know, brand mentions. Yeah, that's cool. Any, um, any specific content tools that you like that you use? Yeah, I mean, we use we use a lot of them. I, I I'm actually fortunate in the like sense there's that th there, there's thousands. It seems there, like you know. Well, this is a, this is this is just a few months ago. I told my team, I was like, what I need you guys to do is tell me which software platforms we have access to and which ones we're paying for. And I literally got a list of probably a hundred plus. <laughs> and and crazy? we're not most of them we're not paying for because you know shout out to the the software companies that just want me to review it and then give me access for the rest of my life. Yeah. But the problem is I I there's so many of them, right? I mean, there's so many different ones that we can use and test and, and do this. So the ones that are consistent for us in regards to, and there's, there's, there's different ones for different things that we do. Um, from an SEO standpoint, SEMrush, we've always used um, HREVs or AREVs, however you say it. We've used them for a long time. SpyFu is another one that we use. Um, on the influencer side of things, there's all, you know, influence.co is one that we've always gone yeah. to, to like, you know, if people need some, some stuff, Neil and those guys, um, you know, grin is something that we've used in the past. I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of them that we've used, right. To be able to, to, for different campaigns, it just depends on what we're looking at, but you know, software is, you know, is a great, you know, it's a great tool, obviously to go in and be able to, you know, to, to, make it so you don't have to spend as much time on doing certain tasks in the past that would have to be manual. Right. So yeah, there's a lot of cool, a lot of cool tools. The problem is there's always new ones. And so there's all this I research, know. you know, all these shiny things that you want to go after. Well, that was like for us. So um, I'm sure you're doing content maps and content calendars for your clients, just like we are. Uh, we mentioned Planable because it was one that was a collaborative tool that worked with all the platforms we needed. And it was literally, you know, WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. You put it on there and you can actually see what it's going to look like as a post. Are you using, um, like, maybe if you could just share what you're using for content mapping or content 
uh, distribution? Like, what do you like today? Yeah, so we do, I mean, our big thing is just we use Google Drive um, for like, you know, and actually putting in seem like what content and where we're going to be putting things out. And then we've used different ones in the past. I mean, right now we don't have any that we necessarily use all the time. I mean, really it's just Google drive doc is what we've done. We've tried multiple platforms. I don't want to say who they are because it's not that they, this didn't work well for us or the way that we do things. We use um, Trello obviously for like project management to be able to see where the project slack and, and stuff like that. So there's, you know, there, that's the thing is there's, I think some of them are great in certain areas and some of them are better in other areas. And so we haven't found one that's like, Hey, this is the end all be all for like the way that we work with our clients. But Trillo has been one consistently um, just depends on what type of content we're putting out there, what kind of approval process and all that kind of thing. Yeah. What do you, um, I, I was curious about this too. What do you guys do in the, in sort of like, you know, if you're, you're tracking influencers and you're also tracking brands, technically we're doing a little bit of that too. What's your, uh, do you have any go-to uh, tools for listening, you know, for hearing what's going on out there? Yeah. So we, well, there's a number of tools, but there, we use uh, brand 24 is one of them. For that, that, yeah. yeah. Brand 24. I got some good guys over there. Mention.com. Um, I've done some webinars with them and done some, actually we did a webinar on how to do distribution of content. Um, that was a, a great webinar that did really well. Um, those are two tools that we use. I mean, there's, you know, Google alerts, which is kind of yeah. not really that's working old, that's that well. Old school. Yeah. I mean, it is, it's like, <laughs> I tell you works. what, we can do it for free. Yeah. I mean, it's weird that like I have other, I have other things that, Oh, that's another thing we use. Um, BuzzSumo. Oh it's yeah. Been good for that as well. well Sumo has yeah. been around yeah. forever for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm the good fan was good friends with those guys over there. That does a great job. And I, I use, I set up alerts for not only our clients, but also for myself, for my name, for my company name, um, and just kind of see what's going on. I also set up some other ones for like, you know, influencer marketing and see what, you know, competitors are doing in the market. So there's a lot of, there's some great tools. I set them up for all of them because some of them pick up this better and some of them pick up that better. And once again, it's just kind of this, this thing that all kinds of comes in and like in the morning kind of take a look at a few things and get a better idea of what's going on in the world. It's a mashup, right? <laughs> it is. It always is for sure. Um, yeah. And I don't think a lot of people know that you can actually use uh, Google alerts with hashtags. A lot of people don't know that too. Mm. So if you want to do hashtags and have those on alert, although, you know, there's other hashtag listening tools and then, um, uh, it's funny. I was laughing or smiling as you said, buzz sumo. That's one that I keep on my desktop. And then, I'm really old school. I still have TweetDeck. Do you remember that? I do remember TweetDeck. I was a big <laughs> fan of TweetDeck for sure. Yeah. So it still works. You know, I like to do a lot of listening or track certain shows that I'm plugged into and things like that. And just sort of helps give me a panel of uh, yeah. all my peeps. Well, the thing is, is I mean, when, anytime you're going into Twitter, you need some kind of a filter because that, you know, I, I always Ooh. call Twitter... Twitter to me is like I and what I always joke around about is like Facebook is like the dinner party and Twitter is like the drunk after party. It's like you just never know what you're going to see there. Like people are you know maybe had a little bit too much and they're doing some this and doing that and you got to filter through all the all the stuff that's going on there to kind of find out who you want to listen to and you know who you want to respond to and talk to. Yeah, it's definitely a fire hose. <laughs> For sure. For sure. <laughs> um, you and I both uh, know Mark Schaefer. He's a, he's yeah. a good guy. Um, did you, did you happen to read his marketing rebellion at all? I didn't. I did read uh, known. Yeah. No, um, and, good. Yeah. So I, I read known. And so it was funny. So I actually had him. He was one of the speakers that I had at UCLA uh, for my, the class at UCLA. So he came and spoke. Well, he didn't come, but we did a, a Skype call right. um, and he spoke about being known and kind of like, you know, personal branding and like what you need to do and the different stories and the, the comp or the individuals and companies that he spoke with and kind of the background of that. So yeah, it was, it's, it was a, it was a great book. Great book. Yeah. Well, he talked about the fourth rebellion and I'll just shortcut it for you, but I'm curious on your thought on this is he said that, you know, in today's world, you know, especially because we're both in influencer marketing and, and it typically feeds into this, but it's almost like the, the micros and the nanos are on a hot surge right now because um, people, um, people are making, you know, all the decisions, right? So they're the ones that are in full control. So it used to be whoever, you know, ran the most ads and made the most noise, got the most money. And, you know, that's the old Mad Men view of things. But in today's world, it's interesting how, um, you know, how the, the individual is in such control of how we do business or how we communicate with them or work with them. And, um, and so, you know, in the channels of you putting out content and making those choices and how people consume it, do you have a certain strategy for, for making sure that there's also that 
personal feel to it, like you're delivering that content specific for me. And it, what do you mean in regards to like, well, like, well, like influencers? You, yeah, I mean, like, uh, like on your content, the way it's written and things like that, at least, you know, for years to me, I feel like, wow, Shane knows exactly what I want and he's writing it for me. So um, do you use that strategy with your customers where you're like, okay, here's the ideal target and we have to make sure that they feel like this is personalized just yeah. for them? Yeah, that's important. It is, is that you have to figure out who your audience is, right? And so that's the hardest part is like, how do I, you know, because you can write very general content and that's okay. But once you really have gotten, you know, like who your avatar is or who you think your perfect client is, and then writing content that they feel is like being written for them is, is can be special, right? I mean, because they're like, yeah. wow, I feel like, like you said, I feel like this content was written for me. Um, and then once can stand in front of them. So we do, you know, email blasts and we'll say, Hey, Shane just wrote a new article or we'll have the, the stuff that pops up on the, the you know, desktop and when, you know, so they get notifications. Right. There's a lot of different things that we do there, but it, it is important to, for people to feel like, wow, it's like Shane really gets what I need, right? Like here goes, I mean, that's for me, my goal on the, on, on the website is to create value. Like, Hey, I want you yeah. to read this and go, wow. You know, I always had a question about that. And now I read this. And I'm good. Like, I don't, you know, I don't need to hire, she don't need to hire anybody. Hey, I, I get it. Or they, they get enough information like, well, I feel like I need a little, a little bit more information. So let me reach out to Shane and ask a few more questions. And then maybe I even hire his company because it seems that you know, he knows what he's talking about when it comes to X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Right on. Right on. And, um, uh, so are you reading any books right now? Are you into any books that are out there that you want to recommend? Yeah. You know, it's funny. So I, um, I am. There was one. It was, I was, yesterday was on a podcast. It was called The 12. Oh my God, I just downloaded it. I haven't started reading it yet. So I can't say whether it was good or not. In fact, I can't remember the name of it. I'll have to look it up. It's like The 12 Day something. Anyways, that's nobody's going to go look up The 12, 12 Days, days of Christmas. Like, they have Christmas. Yeah. It's about <laughs> it's only Christmas. 98, it's that's, only 98 days away for those of you Christmas yeah. trackers. And it talks about Santa Claus and how he's real and stuff. I'm like, <laughs> as a kid, you know, the kid inside of me really wants to know about that. I want to be able to meet him one day. Right. Um, plus, I never got my bike when I was seven. So I'm a little pissed about that. But, well, you know, we'll work through it, I'm sure. Once I talk to him, I'm send him another letter. But um, yeah, there's a few. I mean, I'm always trying to, like, you know, dive into some new books. I've, with, if I had a, a dollar for, you know, every audible book that I downloaded, um, I would, I I would, I would probably have a thousand dollars right around there. But, um, I try to go back to every few months. I try to go back to some of the oldies and goodies, you know, like, uh, the morning ritual is one that I just, you know, cause I'm a big fan of like how you start your days, you know, how you like, you know, how you kind of manifest the rest of your day. Um, big fan of that. And then there's just some, some old school classics like think and grow rich and all that kind of stuff where I just think is, where I forget, you know, some of the stuff, like some of the basic stuff they talk about. And then I, so I enjoy that. I mean, I go on, I mean, I don't know if people know this. I mean, I, I just checked my Fitbit. I'm not even kidding you. In five years, I've gone 30 million steps. Wow. I mean, like it's insane. Yeah. And so I figured it's like six miles a day is my average. And so that's, and that was even when I went through an injury, hurt my back at CrossFit and boxing. It's a long story, but um, better now, but it's, yeah, I, I, so during those times is when I talk with my team and work on Slack and do this. And then I also like to, do a little bit of listen to some music. And then I also do audibles as well and, and listen to some, you know, whatever it is. Sometimes it's self-help. Sometimes it's business books. And then I also got into a, an interesting phase of like motorcycle gangs, <laughs> like Mongols. And like, I don't know I got into this thing of like gangs and drugs and uh, not me personally, because I yeah. would rode a motorcycle. I'd probably kill myself, but I don't know. Like, I guess that was outside of my like business stuff. I was like, let me listen to like, if I was to join a motorcycle gang and sell crack <laughs> cocaine and kill people, like, you know, I don't, I'm not saying they all did that, but it was just right. really interesting. It, it, it pulled me in for whatever reason. Yeah. It was the other side, right? So the other side, I guess. Of the yeah. Right. I'm like, so that's what they do over there. I'm like, I don't really want to be on that side. I just wanted to learn about it. Yeah. And I, um, I actually grew up in that environment. So as you were saying that I was like, you know, co-voyaging into that moment, but, um, but yeah, it's interesting to, uh, to think about the other side. I, I grew up, I grew up like in a lower middle class and around all that stuff, but the country club was at the end of the block and that was my finish line or my motivator to get into that country club. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's, uh, it's interesting how, uh, different lives come together. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right. So, um, so as we wrap up, um, I've got like five things that I didn't get to, but you know what, we'll have you on again because it's, uh, it's always good talking with you. And so yeah, let's bring, sure. let's bring Jackson and Monica on. And then I want to hear from the audience a little bit. Um, 
on some of our channels about what you got out of today's session. Now, Shane, we have this thing where we require that uh, the people that listen to our program, uh, as soon as they hear it, they have to go share whatever they learned with somebody, uh, you know, within the next, uh, within that time period. So the next conversation that they have or somebody that they care about, they actually share something that inspires them or they learned about in today's program. So as people are typing in what they learned from you, uh, let's go to Monica. How much? How many notes did you take, Monica? <laughs> I took all the notes on all the tools you've used. <laughs> Actually, I was um, talking to uh, one of the guys from Brand24. Um, seems like a really good platform, and you also just called it out. So I definitely want to do more research into that. Um, and then uh, a question for you. When it comes to um, just engaging with your audiences, is there any platforms you would recommend within that? Um, yeah. I mean, when it comes to engagement, I mean, it's, I don't really, so we used to, I, I tweet deck was one that I used to use quite a bit. I used to be really active on Twitter. Um, mm -hmm. and you know, I, I don't really have any tools that I necessarily go and, and take a look at everything. I've used them all. I mean, I've you know used them back in the day. I just mainly, you know, I have a, I have a good sized team now. Right. Mm -hmm. So when I've trained a lot of my team and this is terrible to say, but I've trained a lot of my team to like, Hey, if there's people asking specific questions that we don't know how to answer, then, that's great. But most of the times it's the thank yous and, Hey, we really appreciate it. And thanks for including us. And, you know, pretty, I say basic answers, but we want to make sure that we're engaging with people. If they have deeper questions, then mm -hmm. usually what they'll do is they'll send it over to me and say, Hey, Shane, is this something that, you know, that you can respond to? And I say, absolutely. So, you know, I try to, because it's, there's a lot of messages, right. And there's a lot of people responding to stuff and talking yeah. about this and talking about that. So, you know, it becomes a thing of like, how do you filter through that and you know, be able to like get it so that it's palatable. And so if not, I'd be answering just questions all day and I wouldn't be doing mm -hmm. anything else that's productive. So, you know, I try to spend, you know, anyways, about a half an hour a day answering some stuff where my team couldn't answer something that was once again, something over than uh, something other than just a basic question. Mm -hmm. And then how, how often does your team engage with your clients okay. yeah oh you mean like with my clients like mm -hmm. how often are we talk with our clients yeah so no, almost, you mean, no do you mean the client accounts or do you mean the actual clients uh client accounts yeah so like in their in their audience like how often mm -hmm. do you engage on their behalf so we actually don't so we what we do is we like to train them to, to show them how to fish instead of giving them some fish. So we don't do any management of actual profiles. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we'll, once again, it's more of a consulting side of like, Hey, in these situations, you should do this. Or, you know, what you want to do is set up some kind of a, you know, something internally that you, where you guys have these specific questions and they can be answered this way. But we actually don't, I don't take on anybody's Instagram. I don't take on anybody's Twitter account. I mean, I get a lot of people is like, Hey, how would you like to take on my Twitter account? I'm like, Hey, I do not want to take on your Twitter account. Like I love you to death and you seem awesome. And I'm sure that would be great, but I don't, well, you know, I'm in celebrities. They're like, Hey, you want to take my Twitter? No. What about my Instagram? Nope. Don't want to do that either. So, so are you, like, are you, are you, you using uh, shock collars then to get them to adhere to you? Yeah, I, I do. <laughs> I, I have, uh, I do. We have mob style tactics that get people to listen <laughs> See, over that's time. That's why you were listening to the gang stuff because you it. Go gang stuff. I had to learn. I had to learn. I was like, listen, I'm gonna go get a leather jacket and I'm gonna go get a Harley and I'm gonna come down there. I'm gonna teach you a little lesson and you're gonna start listening to me because I am the consultant and you are the client. Um, yeah, it's only had to, I've only had to do that two or three times. Not that big. It's been a slow week. Um, but yeah, no, it, it's for us, it's, we, we really want the, we want the client to be able to take that on. Right? right. I mean, as much as we'd like to take that on for the next 10 years for the client, we really think there's, there's huge value in them training somebody internally on how to deal with that and how to work with that. And mm -hmm. then hopefully that you can keep that engagement going and, and keep things moving. Cause if we know how to do it and you guys don't, and then you guys let us go or somebody lets us go. And then it's like, well, then where are you? You haven't anything that we've, we haven't trained you on anything. We've just literally like just done something for you and then it drops off. So yeah. we're more on the education side of things. Makes yeah, sense. That's cool. Yeah, that's good. Jackson, what'd you learn? Uh, well, I mean, just like what, uh, you know, what Kyle had mentioned in the comments was that uh, talking about those stories that, you know, you like to hear and that like, that makes the difference. And I never really thought about it that way. Like I, I always knew that that was a very important part of the brand and that, you know, that really drives a lot of it. But I never thought of it in the way that you had said it, where it's like, the wine doesn't taste better 
<laughs> it's just it just makes it cooler almost. You know what I mean? To have that kind of history. Cause like I drink at this bar across from Second City, and it's like one of those that John Belushi and all those guys hung out at. And so yeah, I'll pay five dollars a beer just because I get to sit in a stool that's it's close to the one that John Belushi used to sit in every day <laughs> after or before class or whatever. That's, that's part of the story, right? I yeah. mean, that's, there's, there's value in that. So you're not trying to play the, the price game because you're only going to lose in that game. Mm-hmm. What you're doing is you're educating people why there's, you're literally sitting on the stool that John <laughs> Belushi was at. Like the history of that is like, that's why you're paying a little more for it and you're willing to do that. And then, you know, you see these old bars that have all the pictures of all this and the celebrities that yeah. came in. It's awesome. You know, I mean, there's, that's a, there's something about that. We feel like, God, this is like, I'm kind of a part of history. I'm in here experiencing it. And then you don't think about price because that's just not a, that's not a, a game you want to go down, especially if you have 75 bars in the area, you can go broke real quick. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's funny. And in that same bar, I walked in expecting to see the Cubs game on the TV before one of Jackson's shows. And all of a sudden I look up and the Marx Brothers was on. I go, this is cool. I've never walked into a bar that actually had the Marx Brothers on TV. Yeah, a lot of them around the Second City have like Marx Brothers. Uh, the one that's in the Second City, 1959, the year that it was established, they um, uh, they always played Cheers reruns and things like that because you know, the guy that played Norm, George Went came from Second City and – did all that so but it's just you know great environment but i i completely understand like like that was the biggest thing that clicked with me i was like oh that's why i'm totally cool with paying five dollars for a bud light like you know what i mean like (laughs) yeah like yeah yeah, that doesn't bother me because you know like they got pictures of chris farley and stuff hanging out (laughs) here you know like you know whatever but yeah yeah no it makes sense yeah stuff all right. Well, Shane, uh, we want to thank you so much. And Jackson, who's our two winners today? Uh, for today, we have on Facebook, Tom Harness. He was commenting Hi, on Tom. everything <laughs> on, uh, Sh- that Shane was saying. And then uh, Glenn Stewart in Zoom. Ah, Glenn Stewart. I think he's uh, from Canada, up north, right? I believe so. Or no, he's up He's up north somewhere, right, Glenn? <laughs> or I got it wrong. Sorry, it's, that's the wrong Glenn. <laughs> oh, also, just in case anybody was wondering, it is actually, like, I, I like to fact check a lot of the things that we say on the on the podcast just so we're not like, yeah, that's the, just roll with it, you know? But uh, it is 98 days until Christmas, for those of you who are wondering. I, like, was like, there's no way he just pulled that number out of thin air. Like, uh. <laughs> Like he's yeah. a, he's a smart guy, but he's not, he's not that aware of yeah. how far I, away Christmas is. <laughs> I'd be a terrible president. I'd be like, I just thrown out facts. Like, I don't know. I'm just, this is how, this is just how I feel. Like, I'm not sure if any of this is true. They'd be like, look into what Shane says. Yeah. I, I wouldn't read my blog either. Cause I don't really look into that either. We just write stuff. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> All right. Cool stuff. Well, Shane, always a delight. We learned so much from you. Thanks for, uh, for, you know, really sharing your knowledge with us and being part of our family here and uh, love to have you back sometime. And I'm sure I'll see you at a conference coming up soon. So uh, thank you again for being part of the show. Absolutely, man. Well, I'm, I'm ready to see you at a conference here soon. And anytime you guys want to have me back, I'm ready. All right. We'll see you online and everybody online. We'll see you online too. So thanks everybody. All right, guys. Yeah. Thank you for listening to the Influence Factory podcast. We welcome feedback and suggestions. You can provide these by visiting our website at www.myinfluencefactory.com. And if you are interested in Social Jack's 90 Days to Influence program, you can simply go to 90daystobusinessinfluence.com and simply ask for the next steps. While our program airs regularly on Zoom webcasts and Facebook Live on Wednesdays at noon central, we invite you to download episodes on your favorite channel, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spreaker, SoundCloud, and who knows where else in the future. We will also provide occasional on-location live streams with special guests that we will announce in our community Facebook group, Business Influencer Alliance, as well as on all Social Jack channels. Our mission is to help you build your digital business influence with this podcast, as well as inspire, educate, and entertain those who are hungry to collaborate in a cool place with cool business professionals just like you. (laughs) 